Hello, everyone. <laughs> we have a distinguished guest, Eric Jan Zürcher. Am I pronouncing it right? Yeah, that's that's about right. I I know a little bit German. It's like Zürcher. Zürcher. Yeah. Zürcher. Eric yeah. Jan Zürcher, a professor emeritus, holding a PhD degree from Leiden University in 1984, and a person who has many studies on the history of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. Dear Mr. Zusha, first yes. of all, thank you for kindly accepting our invitation to the interview. You're welcome. And uh, we must tell you that we are honored to be hosting you here because, you know, it's a, just a modest channel and it's a modest class in Turkey. And we, we are really honored. This is this is something sincere from coming from inside. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And sir, we have covered your book, Turkey and Modern History in our academic English class this year. And right. we thought that it would be a perfect end of the term event if we could interview with you. And my students got extremely excited when they heard this, uh, when I informed them that you accepted the invitation. And before starting, away. <laughs> and before starting, sir, I'd like you to introduce yourself to our viewers. Oh well, um, well, you already noted that I. Um, I graduated in uh, in Turkish studies and then did my PhD on uh, Turkish history, modern Turkish history back in 1984. Uh, since then, I've been attached to several universities, all of them in the Netherlands, Nijmegen, Amsterdam, and uh, ended up in Leiden as the chair of Turkish studies in Leiden. In the meantime, I've also been uh, attached to the International Institute uh, of Social History in Amsterdam. And I've been director uh, both of that institute and of the Leiden Institute of Area Studies uh, over the past few years. I'm, I'm retired now. Uh, my field of interest has always been the transitional phase between the late Ottoman Empire and the Republic of Turkey. So roughly speaking, say the period 1900, 1950. And uh, on that I've published, um, I think 13 books, um, which have all of them been translated into Turkish, by the way, they're all available in Turkish. Uh, and also a number of other languages. Um, and uh, the main focus has been on the role of the um, Young Turks, otherwise had the Unionist, the Itahad mm -hmm. um, First, the role of the Unionists in the early Republic, uh, then more switching to um, the origins of the Young Turk movement in, in Macedonia and um, uh, in, in, in Rumeli. Um, and uh, after that, also a lot of work on the period of World War I. Uh, so the most recent articles have been uh, on, say, the com a comparative study of the, young, of, the, of the Constitutional Revolution, 1908. Um, the uh, political culture uh, of the Itihad Vetaraki during World War I, and most recently on um, the ideology of the Mili Mujadele, where we can place that when we look at it in an international context. So that's about it. I'm now retired, have been uh, retired since last year. Uh, but I continue to write, obviously, and, and also to do a bit of research. Uh, that's it. Yeah, and thank you for introducing yourself. And I, I did some little research about you, and you've been invited everywhere, but real distinguished places, not a modest one like this. Um, you have been also active in EU talks 
with Turkey, right? You took active a long time, long time ago. Yes, back in uh, 2003, 2004. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but, in... uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, when that whole process started and it looked very promising at the, at the time, uh, we remember I was involved, not not directly involved, obviously, but in an advising capacity. And you've been in the editorial boards in many journals, and you yeah. know that you've written many books too. And Mr. Zusha, before uh, asking you my students' questions, or my students ask you their questions, I'd like to ask you some general ones. Uh, I hope first, first of all, I hope you've been well in the pandemic days. Any problem with it? Ah, uh, no, no. no. <laughs> Great deal then. That's uh, an advantage of being retired, probably. <laughs> Have you been vaccinated? Yes, yes, yes. Great. great. Recently, we, last week. Last week. And we yep. wish you a healthy life <laughs> away <laughs> from the corona. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, obviously, when you're retired and working mostly from your study, uh, it, uh, you're not exposed that much to. Uh, to the coronavirus and um, and most of the people I know are also safe. Uh, we had a couple of uh, um, people uh, suffering, but uh, but not very close relatives or anything. And uh, also the ah oh, yeah, that's something that that uh, I did forgot to mention, but um, maybe interesting to uh, to a Turkish student audience that over the times. Um, I had many PhD students, and nearly all of them were from Turkey. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, what that means is I've now had um, um, 27. And um, it means that most of them are actually in Turkey and working in Turkish universities now. So there's a, there's a whole, uh, have people like Doğan Çetinkaya and Emre Erol and that, so many others, Umut Azak. Um, and that's that's a particular uh, joy, of course, that there's a whole network of former students uh, now teaching in in a range of Turkish universities. And sir, um, we have divided the questions into into three: uh, personal questions, and Ottoman era questions, Republican era. Okay. And I have some questions about feature, which are not. You don't need to spend too much you know, academic thought on it, just you know, your ideas in general. Um, let's go on with the general questions about you. Uh, Ipek is not here, actually. I wish she could do it, but she has a question. What was your source of inspiration for examining Turkey's recent history? And how did you continue the research and I have a similar question. How did you become interested in the history of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire? Well, you know, that's always a difficult question to answer because you tend to rationalize. Uh, people tend to rationalize when they look back at their own choices and their own history, they make up a story, which makes it seem all very logical and rational and in fact, it's not really like that, of course. Uh, it's, it's often, you know, a particular history teacher in school, for instance, whom you like, or um, a visit to a country. It's, it's, it's very often not that rational and that, not that traceable. And I think if I'm honest, I, I have to say that I don't know. I... Um, I became interested in the Ottoman Empire, not necessarily modern Turkey, um, in high school. Wow. Uh, and I can, I mean, th there's proof of that because I wrote several high school papers on the Ottoman Empire. Um, so um, then when uh, I needed to decide on university uh, studies, I, actually hesitated. Uh, um, I, I, I had been interested in the Middle East and in the Ottoman Empire for, for years. But when it came to the crunch, I hesitated between Japanese studies and Middle East studies. And in the end, decided to go for Middle East studies. 
I actually started out studying Arabic, not Turkish. And that's one, another of those coincidences. I uh, completely failed my exams in the first year um, and also had a very bad relationship with the one who was teaching basic uh, Arabic, elementary Arabic at the time. So I decided to switch to Turkish. <laughs> you know, so I wish that I could come up with a more rational or more dignified uh, reason, but there isn't. I, I just, that's the way it happened. That's so once, I, <laughs> once I was studying Turkish, uh, I, and I still had that historical interest that I had in high school. Of course, then, then it took off and uh, I discovered that there was uh, enormous uh, amount to know about Ottoman history. So then it took off. Mm -hmm. the, the interest in, in modern Turkish history um, came at the time of my MA thesis because um, I did an MA thesis on the Izmir Suikaste, the Izmir conspiracy in 1926 and the trials that followed it. And as I did that, and I wrote an MA thesis on it, um, I got a feeling that um, there was a fundamental misrepresentation there. Now that when I read, and don't forget, this is this is um, late seventies, and so that's that's it's forty five years ago, and Turkish historiography was very way different from what it is now. It was still much more uniform, state-dominated, uh, official history. And uh, when I read that, I had a feeling that there was a fundamental misconception, that there was something wrong, uh, because the way it was represented was that there was a newly founded republic, invented, as it were, by uh, Atatürk, by Mustafa Kemal Pasha and his circle, and that there was an attempt by the former leaders, the unionists, to try and regain power. I see. And that didn't seem to work because when I started looking into that Izmir Sulkast, I discovered that on all sides, you know, uh, among the people accused, but also among the people who are actually in the tribunal, in the independence tribunal mm -hmm. that ran the and also in the political leadership of the Republic, they were all unionists. Yes. They all had a unionist background. So I felt that that history needed to be rewritten. And ultimately that's what I did my PhD on. And the main thesis, I, I guess you could summarize as follows, you know, it was not, a newly in the, uh, founded republic by a new independent leadership uh, with the old you know, leadership of the unionists trying to regain control, it was the opposite. It was a movement started and created by unionists. And it was in fact the circle around Mustafa Kemal Pasha who uh, through a kind of internal coup d'etat established control over the movement. Uh, so that's a reversal. That's a, that's a complete reversal of the relative roles of, you could say, unionists and Kamalists. So that, that's the way it happened, more or less. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, without going much into the, the history, there are some more personal questions. First of all, how much Turkish do you know? Do you know any Turkish? Türkçe'de konuşabiliriz istersen. <gülüyor> Ama evet. <gülüyor> tabii this, need, this needs to be international. Uh, so tabii. Uh, uh, Türkçe kaynaklardan da faydalanmam gerekiyor. <gülüyor> We can also Her practice gün. together if you wish. Okay. No, we'll, we'll <gülüyor> stick to English. But this answers your question, I hope. Yeah, it does. And yeah, I know Turkish and Ottoman. And on a lower level, also Arabic and Persian. How, how did you learn Turkish? Did you come to Turkey? Yeah, uh, theoretically in university. Uh, but uh, certainly in those days, uh, learning a language 
basically meant learning to read and write, primarily to read. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, practical skills were not learned in university that much. So you needed to acquire those after university. Uh, yeah, by going to Turkey. Um, but I would have to say uh, mostly by working in Turkey because uh, I did uh, go to Turkey a lot uh, starting in 1971. <clears throat> um, but when I was working at the Institute of International, uh, the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam to build a collection of archives and publications from social movements in Turkey, which is broadly speaking, workers' movements, emancipatory movements, movements of the left, and so I worked with a number of people in Turkey collecting that. And that meant negotiating, that meant, you know, uh, long visits to people um, who, who had these collections and trying to persuade them to uh, either uh, give or sell them to us. So then I really had to use Turkish in a meaningful sense in difficult situations. And that's in, that was in the um, uh, 80s and 90s, and, and that really helped. Great. And uh, any memorable moments in Turkey, M memorable experiences that you can't forget? Well, I've, you know, um, it's been 50 years and I've been to Turkey uh, way over a hundred times. So that, uh, that is difficult to answer. Um, many of course, but I would say the overriding lasting uh, impression is of the incredible change. Um, you know, you would not recognize the Turkey that I, visited in the 70s and, and early 80s, um, it would be an alien country to you. Um, uh, and, and it was, it was a country of scarcity. Uh, it was a very cheap country also. <laughs> uh, it was, um, it was an, a very closed country um, in all kinds of senses. Um, People were, of course, there was no internet, uh, there was only state television. Uh, so the grip of, let's say, the officially sanctioned uh, view of the world uh, was almost total. Uh, people had no independent access to knowledge about the world. It was, it was still a very, very closed country. And I was born in 1981 yeah. and, uh, you know, I'm comparing my childhood with today, and you can see a lot of difference. It's the same for me. I had the same <clears throat> experience. Yeah, definitely. And then you have to consider that, you know, when you grew up and became conscious, that was in the Turkey of Özal, uh, which had undergone revolutionary change when you compare it with the Turkey of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you grew up in a free market oriented Turkey, for instance, with all the, the good and the bad. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not judging that, but um, that, that, was, uh, uh, that was a real revolution. Uh, the, uh, the way that uh, Özal um, transformed the country in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mr. So even, that, even that was change. <laughs> yeah, even, even Tugutazal's legacy have changed a lot, right? Um, we have the questions from our students. Um, my first question, actually, it's not my first question. Haluk, Haluk Halhal uh, wants to ask the first question about the Ottoman era. Mustafa Haluk, are you there? I think he is. Yeah, yeah I can see his name. 
Would you like to ask your yeah, question? Can you hear me, teacher? Hello? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think well, the sound is very, very weak. Yeah, yeah, weak and also it's very slow. Maybe uh, I have you your... can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Let's try uh, once or, or else I can read the question too. Okay, speak loudly and please ask your question. Okay. Uh, was there socialism in the Ottomans? Uh, if yes, how was socialism exercised during the reign of the Ottoman Empire? Uh, was it under the monopoly of some societies or was there really a socialist thought and moment? Thanks, Inanus. Socialism, you mean? Yes, yeah, socialism. Ottoman socialism. Socialism in the, in the Ottoman era. Yeah, Ottoman, well, socialism came to the Ottoman Empire late, of course. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it was uh, primarily a movement uh, that developed among the non-Muslim communities of the empire. And the, the best known examples of Ottoman socialism uh, are um, those in, in Salonika, Selanik, mm -hmm. uh, um, to a lesser extent Izmir and also Bulgaria. And they were movements largely of um, Jewish, um, Greek and Bulgarian um, um, workers, um, and to, to a lesser extent intellectuals. And of course, there was among the Armenians a very strong socialist movement, uh, the Dashnak Tsutyun, and the main, uh, uh, let's say, nationalist um, Armenian organization was also a social democrat organization. They called themselves that, and they were members of the Socialist International. Um, among Ottoman Muslims, um, it's developed far slower. Uh, there is the example of uh, Socialist Hilmi, um, um, but um, uh, the problem, of course, was that, or the fundamental problem, you might say, is that when you look at uh, Europe, uh, European countries of the day, socialism as a movement developed in industrial settings. Uh, and the Ottoman Empire hardly had any industrial settings, very little. It was limited to a few uh, big uh, towns and cities and um, to things like the, the mines. Um, but um, uh, so the absence of industry meant an absence of um, a modern working, working class, an industrial working class. Uh, so the, the, the opportunities for socialists to organize were extremely limited. Uh, with the disappearance of the, um, uh, with the minorities, um, the most vibrant elements of the socialist movement also disappeared. You know, after the Balkan War, when uh, Thessaloniki is lost, um, yeah, the, one of the main centers of Ottoman socialism is also lost. Uh, and so, uh, and, and uh, when the Armenians, uh, you know, uh, go in, in World War I, uh, again, I mean, one of the key elements of Ottoman socialism is lost. So that's why and, um, you also have to understand what there was in uh, terms of industry in the late Ottoman Empire was very often ethnically organized. In other words, uh, factories owned by uh, Greek entrepreneurs, Greek um, uh, factory owners, very often employed a Greek workforce. And same for Armenians, same for Jewish entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, even within the little Ottoman industry that there was, 
there was an underrepresentation of Ottoman Muslims and therefore also of Turks. And so uh, those are reasons why Ottoman, late Ottoman socialism uh, did not really develop. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we, we have this question from Mustafa from the Ottoman era. We have some questions from the Republican era. And Hakan, are you here? If Hakan is not here, I can read his question. Aloud. Please do. Mm -hmm. Hakan says, I think Turkey would be no different from a Gulf country had it not been for a Kemalist modernist revolution in Turkey. Would you agree with this? Well, no. Uh, Turkey, I mean, let's say uh, Anatolia um, never was like a Gulf country, um, you know, even, even way uh, before the Republic. Um, Anatolia itself uh, in, 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 let's say, in socioeconomic and in cultural terms is, of course, a hugely uh, diverse area. Even when you look at the late Ottoman Empire, the coastal areas, uh, like the Marmara, the Black Sea coast, um, the west coast with uh, Aydin, Izmir, they are to a large extent integrated into an international economy and also into an international um, cultural network. I mean, the links between Izmir on the one hand and uh, Selanik, but also uh, Trieste, uh, Marseille, those links are very intimate, they're very frequent, they're very dense. And the same is true for Trabzon, which was connected to Odessa and to uh, Batumi. Uh, so, uh, and, and at the same time, you could say that inland areas, like um, uh, areas uh, to the east, uh, east of Kayseri, for instance, uh, uh, were very isolated from the international economy and from international cultural uh, networks. So Anatolia was extremely diverse, but um, part of it was um, already um, modernizing and had been modernizing for decades in different ways, as Jem Emrenger has, has convincingly argued. It was uh, uh, modernizing in different ways. And uh, one of the forms in which it was modernizing was that a modern state on the European pattern gradually came into being. And when you look at the development of the Ottoman Empire between 1800 and 1900, you see an enormous growth in the state. And if you want to uh, see proof of that, just go to any provincial capital in Turkey and you will see huge buildings, barracks, schools, um, konaks, uh, government buildings, and uh, railway okay. stations. So, so what you see in, in uh, let's say around 1900, in Anatolia, what is now Turkey, it is an area that has been modernizing in all kinds of different ways for about a century. Uh, that is partly connected to international networks and where there is a growing state, um, bureaucracy, army, the whole thing. Now, when you look at the Gulf area, uh, until the discovery of oil, um, which in that area is in the 1940s. <clears throat> you know, the Gulf area was one of the most backward areas of the whole Middle East. Um, living off uh, sea trade, uh, pearl diving, it was uh, in the hands of uh, feudal families protected by the British. So, you know, the, 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 the point of departure of the Gulf area or even the Arab Peninsula and what is now Turkey was completely different. So to answer the question, 
Turkey would have been tremendously different from the Gulf area with or without uh, the Kemalist uh, revolution. Um, but uh, that said, of course, uh, it, it, um, it has been an it has been in a very important in the sense that it established the idea of a secular state where that did not happen in the countries of the of the uh, the gulf and so it's important but we should not make the mistake of thinking that without the kemalist reforms uh, turkey would be similar to the Arab Peninsula, because it never was similar to the Arab Peninsula, oh, not before either. Just with this sentence, uh, I want to ask my question, sir. Um, yeah. Having talked about Kemal's role, what what do you think of Mustafa Kemal's role in the War of Independence? And a second question: How did the struggle in Anatolia affect other countries? living uh, within empires um well the first question is is in a sense um the easiest to answer um and it's the the role of uh, mustafa kemal pasha has been to unify um the um existing resistance movements and organizations that sprang up all of Anatolia and uh, tra Trace, Trakia, uh, after November 1918. There have been many of those, uh, more than 20. Um, there were also other you know, administrators and uh, officers who, who decided to go to Anatolia to resist the coming uh, peace treaty uh, before Mustafa Kemal did. He was not a pioneer there. But there were, were quite a few people who had already decided to start resistance before he did. But his um, the importance of his role is that he, under very difficult circumstances, managed to weld all those different resistance initiatives into one single whole and to and to keep it whole to keep it unified during uh, the difficult years of 1919-1922 um so that that i think um should not be underestimated um it was a hugely diverse movement uh, with people of all kinds of ideological outlooks and backgrounds uh, collaborating, not to establish a republic, and that should be clear. What they were fighting for was to maintain um, the independence of Ottoman Anatolia. Uh, they never, during the Mili Mujadele, argued for the establishment of a republic. But keeping that together, um, and therefore effective under against very you know severe odds that i think is the main achievement of uh of mustafa kemal pasha sorry what was the second question um it was um how the struggle in anatolia affect other countries living in empires like uh, india for example yeah, yeah, it, th that was, um, see, the um, when you look at the immediate post-war moment, uh, when the World War I ends in 1918, there is a huge expectation all over the world uh, that the ideas of self-determination and the ideas proclaimed by the American President Wilson that those ideas will also mean that there will be an end to colonialism. Uh, the, 
the expectation in, in countries as far apart as Korea and Egypt and uh, Iraq uh, and India is that Wilson's idea uh, that people have the right to choose their own government, that they have a right to self-determination, uh, that that will be applied universally. And then there is a huge disappointment because it turns out that that idea is applied in Europe and where the Poles and Yugoslavs and the Czechs get their own states, but that there is no intention to apply it worldwide. In other words, and the Americans uh, are not able to, to, to force the French and the British to give up on their colonial empires. So you get a lot of disappointment and a lot of resistance of people who had high expectations and then within a year lose those hopes. Now, then you come in a situation where in one corner of the world, and that is Turkey, uh, people by their own strength through armed resistance are able to um, not only demand, but also get their independence. And that, in, that, in those circumstances, that is a huge inspiration um, because it is um, uh, that, that unfulfilled promise of Wilson that peoples would now have the right to self-determine. Uh, that is now accompanied by an example of a people who have been able to actually do that. Uh, so that's inspirational for people as far apart as Egypt and Indonesia and India. And they all see that as, an, as, as the way so you, you have to fight for it. That's basically the idea. By the way, it's also an inspiration to the early Nazi movement in Germany, uh, who, of course, have had to sign the Versailles Treaty. Uh, so they, and, and among the extreme nationalists in Germany, uh, there is the idea that uh, their own leadership has failed. They have had to sign the Versailles Treaty. Germany is disarmed and it loses a lot of territory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but look, hey, um, if only we had a Mustafa Kemal, we could have resisted. So in the early, Stefan Erik has written a book on that. Uh, when you look at the early uh, publications of the Nazi movement in the 1920s, they see Turkey as the example to follow. Uh, to resist the post-war settlement. There's a huge admiration for Mustafa Kemal there. Yeah, that, that's really, you know, for me, it's, I'm not a historian, I'm an English teacher, and it's shocking, you know, shocking to hear that, yeah, being taken yeah. as an example. Yeah, no, it's well do documented. Uh, there's all kinds of very positive cartoons in the Nazi newspapers showing, uh, you know, um, the contrast between German politicians giving in to the Entente and Mustafa Kemal standing up to the Entente. Um, Hakan has another question. Hakan is not here. I'm going to ask instead of him. Yeah. He says, despite the modernist revolution and the liberal wave in the world, we see that there has been a rightist wave recently, like Trump, Erdogan, Conte, mm -hmm. Macron. Does the rightist wave always have to occur when things go well in countries? It's a difficult question. I wouldn't include Macron among rightists, actually. But um, um, I think that the problem um, And you have to make a distinction, I think, between um, democracy and liberalism here. And that's increasingly important, I think. Uh, what we see uh, is that there is a whole wave, and actually Erdogan, you might say, was the pioneer, a whole wave of 
politicians who are elected in free and fair elections uh, and on that basis claim to be the voice of the people uh, and to express the will of the people as a whole and then go uh, about undermining the rule of law and let's say liberal values in society. That's not just Turkey, uh, that definitely happened in, in Russia as well, but also in India, for instance, in the Philippines. And um, you might say that Trump uh, actually did his best, uh, tried to do that and didn't, didn't succeed in the end. You could also say Orban in Hungary and, and the Polish government are also on that track. They're all elected. There's no doubt about the legitimacy of these uh, governments uh, as such. And they're all populist governments uh, who claim to express the will of the people. But uh, and the problem is not with the electoral system so much and, the, and, you could, and, and democracy in that sense. It is with um, the lack of respect for and interest in, in the rule of law and the liberal values that underpin a democratic society. And that, I think, has to do with a, um, the, the weakness in the development of liberalism. When you look at Turkey, uh, one of the striking things about Turkey, uh, when you look at it as a historian of the 19th and 20th century, is that Turkey has never known successful liberalism. Political liberalism in Turkey has never uh, flourished. Not in the 19th century, not in the 20th century. And the same is true for social democracy. Now, when you look at Europe, and, and uh, you, you ask the question, which are the political forces that have brought, let's say, a liberal system, a rule of law system about? It's precisely liberalism in the 19th century and social democracy in the 20th. And both of these have never developed in Turkey. Uh, so the competition in Turkey is between two forces, which both of them have deeply authoritarian roots. And that is true for the AKP. Uh, when you look at uh, the, uh, the roots of both Bili Gürüş and Bugdo, uh, which are the, the ideological inspirations of Erdogan, uh, people like Necip Fazıl Sakurek, that is a very authoritarian um, even at times fascist uh, heritage. But the same is also true for the Kemalists because um, and the Kemalist Republic is not, uh, uh, although in, in form it, it is a uh, uh, democratic uh, state, of course, it's, it's also a very authoritarian state at the same time. Uh, so the two competing forces in Turkey, I think, are both rooted in authoritarian worldviews and what you what you don't find and what what is a big problem i think for for all those younger urban uh, turkish citizens who who want a different direction for the country uh, what you don't have is a tradition of political liberalism not on the islamist side but not on the secular side either that's when um, people who are deeply opposed to Erdogan but read Sözcü, uh, they're, they're not liberals. Um, so had that, there's that problem. Is it related to a particular stage of success or lack of success? No, I don't really think so. Um, um, but it has to do with... Um, you know, a loss of legitimacy of, of certain political elites in the eye, eyes of the voters. And that is true for the, the um, Republican elites of the 1990s, uh, which, were, which lost legitimacy in, in Turkey. Uh, but it's also true, for instance, of 
uh, the Russia of, of uh, Boris Yeltsin, uh, which was so corrupt and which, which, although liberal in a way, meant so much hardship for so many people who lost their livelihoods that it lost its legitimacy. And you could say that Trump's rise is also based on that, uh, the idea that an elite that that favors globalization and, um, and, and, and liberal values, but at the same time does not manage to, to, to guarantee a decent life for, for all those people who lose their livelihood, uh, the miners, uh, the industrial workers uh, in the country, and uh, that, that creates a lack of legitimacy a loss of legitimacy, and that's where the populists come in. Yeah, the, the word must be populism, right? Populist leaders today. And before moving on to Sheva's question, sir, Guzin, uh, you had a question, which is similar to Sheva's, I suppose. Could you, could you please ask your question? Mm -hmm. Hello, can you Hi. hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Uh -huh. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you. Uh, when I uh, look at uh, the history of my country, I see that sometimes uh, there's a difference between uh, Turkish style and European style, uh, Alaturka and Alafranga, mm -hmm. Turkish means. Uh, in your books, uh, uh, the following point caught my attention. As a professional historian, you are very objective. Uh, however, uh, when you look at Turkish and world history, what do you think is the breaking point? I wonder your opinion on the matter. Uh, the point, meeting point of what? When you look at the Turkish and world history, mm -hmm. oh, what do when, you think? When it when they connect. Breaking, breaking point, breaking point. Ah, yes, I get you, I get you. Or sir, um, uh, there is another question which is similar to this. Uh, okay. I talked to Guzin before she asked this question. I think she's also talking about a turning point. What is the most important turning point in the history of Turkey? Oh, um, that's... <sighs> There are several, there are several, uh, and they're all in a way connected to world history. You're right. I mean, because uh, the Turkey uh, generally moves in step with, with wo worldwide development. Um, I would say that uh, in the history of modern Turkey, the first real turning point is the 1908 revolution, uh, which, which establishes the the Young Turk regime. Um, I would say that the um, the establishment of the Republic is a departure because it was not a given. It was. It's not as if in the Milli um, and there is a growing consensus that Turkey should be a republic. It's a really revolutionary change that comes after the national struggle. So that's a real turning point. Um, the post-war transition to multi-party democracy obviously is. Um, and I would say the 1980-1983 period definitely is. Because uh, when you look at Turkey today, what is it? Uh, it is, to a very large extent, still Evren and Özal's state or Evren's state and Özal's economy. Uh, because uh, the changes that, uh, the, the fundamental changes that were brought then uh, with the new constitution, with the new electoral system, uh, they, those still underpin the political system of today. And so um, some of it has been changed, but not fundamentally. Uh, the, the role of the military and the influence of the military through the National Security Council, that has been abolished. 
Uh, so the military is no longer, as it were, shadow state or shadow government. But the rest of it still stands. And it's precisely that that, that has allowed AKP to remain in power for so long. When you look at the economy, that's still that's also true that uh, the system imposed by the IMF in the early 80s, uh, which mean that Turkey has to be an open economy, uh, that it has to um, uh, make its, its um, currency um, interchangeable, that it uh, has to have a liberal market economy. Well, that is essentially still the same. So I would say when you look at Turkey today, if we understand your question in that sense, uh, what are the, the crucial points that have made Turkey what it is today? Uh, it is to an extent uh, the establishment of the Republic and the establishment of democracy after World War II. But I would say it is primarily 1980, 1983. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Gizim, for your great question. And uh, Ertuğrul has a, a question, uh, maybe the answer which uh, is the way, is the event which led to 1980s. He's asking about the uh, Nationalist Front government who were responsible for the events in the time of the Nationalist Front government, the right or the left wing? Well, the easy answer is both. Uh, but um, um, I think you have to go back a little bit further uh, because it is, in essence, I think the 1971 Muhtara and the, the coup by mem memorandum, the 12th of March, that basically. Uh, puts an end to, the, to the, the, the possibilities for the left to organize um, politically. Um, and, and that leads to a whole generation of younger militants of the left opting for violence, for armed struggle. Uh, and then of course the, the violence of the right that emerges in the 70s, in the later 70s, is a reaction to that. Um, and it differs from the violence of the left in the sense that it is also supported by elements in the state. Uh, there, there, there are uh, certainly under the Nationalist Front uh, coalitions when, of course, the uh, the um, the prime mover of right-wing nationalists is actually in the cabinet. Turkesh is in government. So uh, uh, then uh, the violent groups and uh, the armed groups of the right have the protection of the government and they profit from that um, while the left does not. Uh, but chronologically, the uh, violence of the left predates the violence of the right, but I, I, I insist on, on making the point that it is partly due to the fact that the development of a democratic left and the prime um, example being TIP, of course, and the Turkish party, uh, that and the, the, the way that was stopped in 1971 is a very important reason why so much of the left opted for violent policies. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, we have one more question before talking about the future of Turkey, again from Ertuğrul, and it's about the recent developments in Turkey between 2000 and 2010. How was the politics? What do you think about this era in general? I think that uh, when 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 you um, 
whether you look back on it or um, when you when you try to answer it, um, as it were, from the point of view of people living it at the time, uh, that was a very hopeful period because um, in its first three years in power, AKP, um, you know, um, adopted uh, several hundred new laws, which all helped to dismantle the authoritarian state and to give more uh, influence to Turkish citizens. So there was a real democratization, coupled, of course, to the, um, um, you know, the uh, attempt to, to gain membership of the European Union. And the two went hand in hand. And so from 2002 to 2005, there was a very productive period, which was generally seen, and I also myself at the time saw as a real new departure for Turkey, Turkey uh, becoming a much more democratic um, country, um, more responsive to the will of its citizens and less um, dominated by the state. And um, you could say that um, the high point of that development in the sense of 2007, uh, when after the Republican marches, the army tries once more to intimidate the government uh, into uh, uh, you know in, in, into uh, departing and and it fails uh, the 2007 um, e fails and the attempt to close down the party uh, through the constitutional court also narrowly fails. But I think that after that, um, the AKP lost the idea that it had to um, work uh, to establish a more democratic state um, and to gain membership of Europe. It had basically, after 2007, it had, with the help of Europe, um, subjugated its enemies, particularly the army, of course. And then and the reckoning follows in 2010, 11, with the Ergenicon and Balios trials. Uh, but then that is, you could say, uh, that is settling the accounts afterwards. So I would say that uh, between 2002 and 2007 or eight, those are the glory years of AKP in which they really improved uh, living conditions in Turkey a lot, uh, but also improved the way Turkey was governed and improved, uh, let's say, the rule of law in the country. Now, the question, looking back on it, which I don't have an answer to, the question is, was that purely instrumental? Now, were these developments, were these um, changes, were they just an instrument to make the AKP master of its own house in Turkey and eliminate its enemies? Or was it genuine in the sense that uh, AKP really saw itself as the voice of the people and, you know, uh, uh, its task as establishing popular control over the state. In other words, uh, was the AKP always what it was now, but uh, did it use a number of um, democratic changes in order to establish its power? Or was it a genuine force for democracy and good in Turkey, as we all thought at the time? And has the party really changed into an authoritarian person-dominated structure now? Uh, that is a question I can't answer because you can't look into the hearts of people.
And my last question is about the future of Turkey. How do you see the near future of Turkey, let's say maybe five years or 10 years? It's, I know it's a difficult question, but what are your you yeah. know, perspective? And uh, while answering this question, could you also talk about the EU membership? Is Turkey a uh, European country? Does, it, does she have to uh, choose between the USA, the EU, Russia, or even China? I think Turkey, um, uh, like Russia, like the Ukraine, is a, is a country on Europe, Europe's borderlands, uh, Europe's fringes. Um, a choice? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, um, but uh, equally, I don't think that EU membership is any longer a realistic uh, prospect. I don't think anyone believes in that anymore. Uh, so I don't think we have to think of the future in terms of EU membership. We have to think in of the future in um, terms of relations with uh, the West, uh, with China, with Russia, and of course with the immediate Middle East uh, and Balkans environment. And so I think Turkey will be an independent actor. I think um, overwhelmingly, I would say its interests are in having close relations with uh, Europe and the United States. States. Um, I think the uh, relationship with Russia is purely transactional. Uh, it is, and the, the interests of Turkey and Russia sometimes coincide and sometimes they do not. Um, and, um, but there is, I don't, do not think that there's um, any prospect for a Russian Turkish sort of close alliance in the future. I think it's transactional. Both countries can, there are situations in which both countries can profit from collaboration. And in those situations, they do. And particularly when they feel under pressure from the West. Um, but equally, uh, their interests uh, sometimes um, you know, uh, diverge and they are on opposite sides like in Syria and in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and in Georgia uh, and on the Crimea. Uh, so, um, and in Libya. And uh, so that, that I don't think that is, a, China, yes, of course, is, a, is, a, is a, a new world power that we, and a very old world power that we all have to deal with. Uh, but equally, I do not think that Turkey that's a, that a very close, special relationship between Turkey and, and China is, is very likely. Uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, the best prospect for Turkey is, as it always was, basically, a close um, collaboration with the West, but, but that relationship needs to be repaired. It's of course in a bad state at the moment um, for a number of reasons, but um, uh, the future, yeah, you should never ask historians about the future uh, because there's consistently wrong, of course, in predicting the future. We're about the past. Uh, but um, uh, there, there, there are a couple of things that you can safely say. Uh, Turkey is a major industrial, political, and military power in its region. And that won't go away. Uh, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large country, populous country, and um, the, uh, with Israel, the strongest player in the Middle East. But that's a constant, and that won't change. Um, it's most important um, security relationship with, with the US. It's most important, by far, it's most important economic relationship is with the EU. Those are also more or less constant. And there's a sort of underpinning the position of Turkey. Um, I, I don't think that 
<clears throat> as a major player, Turkey has to be heard, has to be involved in finding solutions for the major problems in the region, whether that's the migration issue or the Syrian civil war or the future of Iraq, um, you know, uh, future of the Caucasus. All of these things are legitimate concerns for Turkey. And it's Turkey is such an important player. It has to be involved in finding those solutions. Uh, that said, I think, and, and the West has to recognize that. Um, the way the Erdogan government has tried to make sure that Turkey is heard, that is by unilateral military advantages, uh, three in Syria, one in Iraq, uh, one in, in the Caucasus, one in Libya. And these are, in essence, uh, it's using military aggression to gain a seat at the table. Um, it may have been effective to an extent, but it has also antagonized uh, the, the, the important partners of, of Turkey. And so what I would like to see is a recognition that when people start talking, or when the discussion is started about the future of Syria or the future of Iraq, and that it is recognized that Turkey needs to be an important, needs to have a voice in that. I hope that this, they, they had, that the mil military adventurism of the Erdogan government, uh, that that uh, is a thing of the past. Uh, thank you very much, sir. You have answered all the questions in detail in such a limited time. My students may want to say thank you to you for a few minutes, if, if you have time. Well, give us, give us I need chance. to go myself, so I'm, I'll, um, I'll have to forego that, I think. But uh, it was a pleasure. So, everyone, thank you for watching. It's been a pleasure to meet Mr. Zucher today. And uh, he was really kind to accept our invitation. Hope to see Mr. Zucher again. And thanks for watching. Goodbye. Take care.